The next part of this module that I want to talk about is monitoring. And this is really right here, you know, monitoring of the serving system. And it's all of these tests, the monitoring tests. So monitoring can take the form of just any you know, web service that's running, has some kind of monitoring uh, software around it, probably monitors the memory used by the server, the CPU load of the server, the number of requests made to the server, the length, you know, the duration of each request's um, answer, and stuff like that. And you can do the same thing for your deployed machine, learnings, uh, machine learning models. So just how much memory is it using, how often is it responding, how long does it take, and so on. You want to put alarms on this stuff, and, um, and you want to be able to record the historical data so that when you make a change, you can go and see if it made some kind of improvement to your uh, response time, for example. An alarm that you might want to set, for example, is number of errors. That's a simple one. So if, you, if your error rate is above 1% for more than a minute, then something's probably wrong. You can set that up in, uh, in your cloud environment. So yeah, like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they all have decent monitoring solutions. There's also startups that do it. And I think that anything that can be logged, well, I know that anything can be logged can be monitored. And I think that it's a good idea to log certain things about the incoming data into your model. So for example, you could, I gave an example of like average pixel intensity of an image that comes in. So that's, you know, it takes like a split second to compute, a split second to print a log. But now when you log it, you can set an alarm on it. So for example, like all of a sudden, if it, if it changes radically, then maybe something changed in uh, upstream of you and like the images are now getting processed differently. So you can get alerted. Uh, we'll actually not explore it in lab eight, but there's also a lab nine, which is optional, which uh, gets into this. Data distribution monitoring specifically, I think is an underserved need. So I gave like a hacky way to do it and just like compute something and log it and then put a log metric on it. But really, why do we have to do this hacky solution? We should be able to just kind of plug something in that does it for us. The one that I've pretty much like the only one I've seen um, is from Domino Data Labs, which is an all-in-one solution I covered yesterday. And so here you can see like there's a column for training data and a column for prediction data. And you can do a test on the distributions. So here it's the KL divergence between these two distributions. And there's a distribution change that's, that's computed. That's the KL divergence between the training data distribution, the prediction data distribution. Um, and then I can set an alarm for it. So if the KL divergence is above 0.3, I get an alert. That's awesome. I wish that was provided by you know, Amazon. And maybe it is in the SageMaker, but I haven't seen it. So this is something that you might want to hack up yourself, or if you use one of these solutions, that might be a selling point of the solution. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, closing the flywheel. We talked about the data flywheel. Like uh, Google Photos asks you if you know, these two photos are the same. So why is it important? I think it's important to monitor not only like the metrics and the statistics of the data and the model, but really the business use of the model. So if you can put a like if you can monitor how your users actually interact with the predictions you make, then that's really the goal, right? Like everything else is just a proxy to that. And as your user uh, interacts with the predictions, maybe if there's a hook for them to report failures or just if their behavior can be indicative of a failure of your prediction, it would be important to have a way to contribute those failures back to your training data set so that you can continuously improve your model. So like in Tesla, right, if I'm driving and the prediction of the, of the self-driving module disagrees with what I'm actually doing, that'll be recorded and sent to the Tesla servers for them to train on, you know, next time they train. Um, for stuff like that, you know, that's self-driving, I just want to give a quick uh, tour of like a model that I have in production, which is for grade scope, um, submissions come in and we want to match them to students in the roster. So we do that with a machine learning model. The first thing I care about is just how many times do we try to do it uh, on a given day? Because if all of a sudden it spikes up or, or, or falls, like if it's at zero, then something's going wrong. Um, but also if it spikes up, I should be more worried than, than usual. The next thing I want to talk about, or I want to see, so that's, that's just like number of attempted matches. 
The next thing I might want to care about is the number of confident matches. So this is the matches that actually happened. So I attempted you know, 100,000 matches, but I, uh, my model was only confident enough on 73.49% of them, and it actually did something on that 73.49%. So if this number changes radically, then again I should be worried because it's been around 70% for like the last, uh, each one of these I believe is a week. So for the last like 12 weeks, it's been around 70%. But if this week it's at 50%, then almost certainly something's gone wrong, and I can have an alarm on that. And you know, weekly is too slow, but I can have a daily um, alarm, for example. The next thing I want to care about is how did the user actually interact with the predictions I made? So these are just like, did I make a prediction or not? That's an important thing. But then, how did the user interact with the prediction I made? So let's say the model matched you know, this um, uh, assignment submission that came in to a given student. But then when the instructor actually reviewed that, they, they said, actually, no, that submission doesn't belong to that student. It, that's incorrect. It belongs to this other student. So how many matches out of the ones that I made did the user correct, right? So this was a bad day or a bad week. It was like 0.4% of all the matches got corrected. And for me, maybe internally, I care if it's 1%. Like if it ever hits 1%, I'll, I'll, I'll drop what I'm doing and look into it. If it's below that, then I'm okay. And, and that is a conversation with business stakeholders, like what is an acceptable level of failure? But once you have that conversation, you can put a metric on it, right? I'm only able to have this thing if I instrument my application to gather this data. That's the, that's the crucial part. And then lastly, if it's useful for me to see all the places I've ever made a mistake in recent, in recent days, um, and be able to like quickly look at what, what has actually happened. So the thing I blocked out is just a link to that uh, to the to the relevant page that I can visually inspect, and on that page I'll be able to easily add that example to the training data set, such that next time I train it, I know that that example that I got wrong is going to be in my training set. So I used uh, a thing called Mode Analytics, which is like a you know like a business intelligence dashboard type of thing for this. Um, and I had to write it myself. So I think that's an opportunity in the space, right? Like maybe that's what all-in-one providers provide for you, like Domino Data Labs. Maybe they make more of this available to you, but I, 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 I haven't seen it. So I think people have to write their own. And it's always going to be different for your use case. So for self-driving car, it's going to be their own interface, their own metrics that they care about. For me, it's what I showed you. And for you, it's going to be something else. But it's important to think about how you're going to close that flywheel. You guys have questions about this part? OK. I, one question. Yeah, so, uh, what do you think about the TFS, which also has a lot of great uses for end-to-end -end deployment? Can we use that as like an all-in-one solution as well? Or would they need all of the different modules to be there? Yeah, so TFX is TensorFlow Extended, which is really I think just Google Cloud Platform, like machine learning workflow, which is now called AI Platform. So all these things are in flux constantly, but part of TensorFlow Extended is TensorFlow Serving. And there's also things about data validation. Yeah. Um, I don't know how good of a monitoring dashboard they give you, if any. Yeah, if it, then it sounds like it could be a good solution. Okay. Yeah, so TensorFlow Extended, which, um, which I think is just part of the AI platform. Is it useful? Like, can I use TensorFlow Extended on Amazon, for example? So the discussion that was just had was just uh, there's a difference between the Google AI platform, which is kind of sold as TensorFlow Extended, and the open source version of TensorFlow Extended that you can install on-prem. They're not at feature parity, but it still might be worth looking into. Um, 